Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, House Republicans vote to repeal much of the Affordable Care Act. We'll see what it could mean for Arizona. Also tonight, a new report questions the rankings of some of the state's top schools. And on National Children's Book Week, we remember the local author behind the popular Junie B. Jones series. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Republicans today narrowly passed a bill that will repeal much of the Affordable Care Act. Republicans say that the plan will increase competition and lower costs. Democrats say that the bill will increase health care costs and leave millions of poor and middle class Americans without insurance. The bill passed 217 to 213 with Arizona's delegation split. Republicans Gosar, McSally, Franks and Schweikert, they all voted for the changes with one Republican, Andy Biggs, voting against along with the state's Democrats, O'Halloran, Grijalva, Gallego and Cinema. In a statement explaining his vote, Representative Biggs said, quote, unfortunately, the American Health Care Act leaves the basic framework of Obamacare in place and continues to commit Republicans to an ill-considered, ill-defined and almost certainly ill-fated three-stage plan to completely repeal Obamacare at an unspecified later date. Even worse, I have seen no compelling evidence that the AHCA will offer substantive relief to Arizona families who have been crushed by devastatingly high health insurance premiums. The legislation still needs to be passed by the Senate, which is not a sure thing. But as it currently stands, the bill would mean significant changes to the country's current health care system. Joining us now is Swapna Reddy, a professor at ASU School for the Science of Healthcare Delivery, and Attorney James Goodnow of Fenimore Cray. Good to have you both here. Let's go over this thing because, uh, again, the Senate's going to monkey around. You just know it's going to change some way. But as it stands, what exactly did the House pass today? Uh, yeah, good question. So what the House actually passed today is sort of a revised version of what it tried to pass about a month ago, the American Health Care Act. Um, and although it was billed as a repeal of Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act, it's really not much of a repeal because of the 10 titles of the Affordable Care Act, um, all but six have actually been left untouched. Um, so really what's happened is uh, a bill that will effectively really change the Medicaid program and definitely affect those with pre-existing conditions. And I want to get to those things quickly because, but the Medicaid program, especially here in Arizona, that's a biggie. But again, did this differ much from the previous plan? And if so, how? Well, at its core, it's the same. We know that the individual mandate is gone, replaced with surcharges for those who have lapses in coverage and come back into the system. But I think the big headlines out of this revised version of the bill comes to pre-existing conditions in these essential health benefits. We know that states now can get waivers where they don't have to provide those. So I think a lot of people are scratching their heads right now, and a lot of people are nervous about that. The pre-existing conditions, let's get to this. Um, what happens to those? I mean, there was supposed to be an extra $8 billion now put in at the last second sure. uh, to get some extra votes, to get needed votes. Mm -hmm. um, will it make a difference? Well, we haven't had a report from the CBO, and we need the Congressional Budget Office usually to tell us how, some, how much something will cost and what the actual effects will be. We had a bill today that passed without a CBO rating, so we can't say definitively what will or will not happen as a result. What we do know, though, is that $8 billion attached to the uh, money that was already promised to offset the changes in premiums probably is only going to offset about 5 percent of the cost, so not going to be particularly effective. And, and there was a protest at the state capitol today, and there was a father there at the state capitol who has a, a child that was just born with a, uh, a heart condition and he's wondering you know what kind of health care will his child live with in the future with this pre-existing conditions as it stands in this bill here are his concerns my concern is the future is down the road for him is that eventually if he's excluded for a pre-existing condition or has some sort of coverage limitation uh, due to having met a financial number that somebody's plugs into a computer then you know, he could be precluded from receiving vital care that can, you know, life saving care, life continuing care, whether it be another transplant or his therapies, et cetera. So, what do you tell this father? I mean, the child's got a heart condition that's a pre existing condition. It sounds as though insurance companies, this bill would let them jack up premiums, correct? That's exactly right. And I think that leads to a larger problem for Republicans. Today, Donald Trump 
was doing a touchdown celebration dance in the Rose Garden of the White House. And I think that's very dangerous for him because when you have Republicans giving high fives and sipping beer and you have gentlemen like that whose lives are being impacted and children who are being impacted, the juxtaposition of those two images can be very, very damaging for Republicans, particularly when those CBO scores come out soon, which will likely show that tens of millions of Americans will lose their health care. What do you tell a father like this who has those kinds of concerns? Sure. I mean, I think his concerns are, particular, are, are perfectly legitimate. Um, and I agree that I think that the image that was portrayed today as a victory is really dangerous because I don't necessarily know who it is a victory for. Um, if children uh, such as the one that he's mentioning actually, if they're not able to get health, health insurance or families can't actually afford premiums, I don't necessarily think that the American public is winning in this process. Okay, but, but th those on the pro side, those who support this say this will lower premiums. Mm -hmm. How? That's a good question. I'm not exactly sure how it would it would lower premiums, and I'm not sure whom it would lower premiums for. I certainly don't think it would lower premiums for those that need it the most, that need the coverage the most, and definitely those with pre-existing conditions. When they say this, what are they saying? Well, I don't think a lot of them know. In fact, there were several Republicans who were really caught feeling nervous when they were asked, did you even read this bill? And several said, no, you don't have good responses. If you take a 30,000 foot view of this, we know that the goal is to get young people into this, young people who are healthy. That will lower premiums, theoretically, for everyone. The problem is, without the individual mandate, you're not gonna have those young people coming into the system. That will shift the burden to seniors, 50 to 64, that will see premium spikes. Okay, the pro side also says it will open markets. How? Great question. There are many times where I have been perplexed in this entire process, and that's one of them. We have a lot of great sound bites that Republicans are throwing around right now, but there aren't a lot of details, and I think that's really why Republicans are holding a health care hand grenade, and they just pulled the pin out of that. So we don't know what's going to happen to premiums. We don't know what's going to happen to markets. The CBO estimates will give us some forecast of that. But I think this is dangerous for Republicans right now. Let's get to Medicaid because it's a big deal. Uh, $839 billion cut to Medicaid over 10 years. The impact on Arizona sounds like it could be considerable. I definitely think so. You know, as we know in Arizona, we were a high need population. We had lots of vulnerable folks that needed coverage. And then when they actually had access to Medicaid expansion, they jumped on the rolls, they, they enrolled. We have over 400,000 people who had now have coverage because of Medicaid expansion. Um, so when we actually, when the AHCA proposes shifting Medicaid from in essentially an entitlement program to a per capita or block grant program, we de definitely risk moving those people out of insurance and back into the ER. I was going to say 400,000 people. What happens to them? Good question. What happens to them? So um, those that already are on the rolls will get grandfathered in, um, but we're not going to be uh, accepting any new enrollees in the expansion population after 2020. And we also know from the continuous coverage provision that if you're not able to maintain coverage for a short amount of time, um, your premiums can get increased. Does this mean the governor, the legislature will have to start rationing? This coverage? That's a good question for the governor and the legislature, but um, from what we know from what they've said so far, they're actually pretty nervous about this. I mean, I think the governor understands the importance of Medicaid expansion for our population here in Arizona. Another report says about 60,000 jobs could be lost in Arizona. That, again, everyone's got studies from all sides. We've got to get out of here, but last question. You mentioned that the, the, the CBO, Congressional Budget Office, passes. The second time we've seen this happen where it's kind of a rush job without finding out what it's going to cost. What's the rush? And is the Senate, forget the rush, we don't, who knows what the rush was. Let's get to the Senate. Are they going to pass anything even remotely similar to this? Not a chance. Not going to happen. Right now, you have an even narrower margin with Republicans having 52 in the Senate. So you have already Republicans on the conservative side, like Ted Cruz or Rand Paul, saying, no way we're going to vote for this. We want a full repeal. Then you have more moderates, perhaps a Jeff Flake, perhaps a John McCain, who are concerned that in states like Arizona, where you have large senior populations, where you do take advantage of that Medicaid expansion, you may have problems down the road. So, boy, it's tough to see anything like what we have now being passed in the Senate. All right.
Good analysis. Good to have you both here. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Thanks for having us. And coming up next on Arizona Horizon, a new report that questions the ranking of some of Arizona's top schools. Hi, I'm Judy Woodruff, co-anchor of the PBS NewsHour. Preparing the next generation of journalists has never been more important than it is now. With its groundbreaking partnership with Arizona PBS, the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at ASU is revolutionizing journalism education to provide students with a real opportunity to work and learn under the supervision of veteran journalists, producers, directors, and editors on newscasts, investigative stories, and documentary productions. The Cronkite School and Arizona PBS reinventing journalism education in the digital age. I just hope they get one of them out of there, actually two of them out of there. U.S. News and World Report recently ranked the uh, best high schools in the country with Arizona's basis charter schools claiming the top three spots and five of the nation's top 10 schools. But a new analysis by the Grand Canyon Institute said that things like demographics and location are currently behind the school's success. Here now is Dave Wells, research director of the Grand Canyon Institute, and Susan Thompson, academic dean of University High in Tolleson, to discuss this report. Um, basis charter schools, five of the top 10 in the United States. Why are they doing so well? Are they doing so well? Well, they're, they're great schools, but they have a really special population. Um, you, you take like Basis Scottsdale, which is supposed to be the top high school. It's, it's located between Taliesin West and Fountain Hills. It's kids in South Phoenix ain't going there. Uh, and so they've got uh, a really more affluent population, and they specialize in really high-achieving kids. In eighth grade, you've got to pass an AP World History class, typically to get into the, even the high school part of it. And most of the Basis kids are taking on average about nine AP tests, they need six to graduate. Um, and that, the US News rankings are all based on how many AP tests you take and how well your students do it. Um, sometimes basis will encourage some students who aren't gonna pass not to take the AP tests. Um, so they're designed to do really good uh, in the US News and World Report rankings. Economically disadvantaged students, many in the basis schools? I think about zero. About, all right, uh, yeah. uh, special education students. About zero. Um, and this is according to the Arizona Department of Education? Right, if you go on, to, you, you won't, you'll find these asterisks which indicate they don't have any. Talk about your school, your school district. Now, uh, turned out pretty well. A little more diverse, I would imagine, than the basis schools? Oh, absolutely, yes, we are. Um, we serve the Tolleson Union High School District, serves the Tolleson community directly, um, and our students um, do fall into all of those various categories that uh, have just been mentioned by my colleague. Yes. Uh, and in fact, our graduating class this year at University High School, um, I, I ran some data, and 34% of those students who are graduating in May, actually English was their second language coming in as freshmen. So that they are high achieving students at University High School, but yes. there's a more diverse Absolutely. number of students. Absolutely. We're um, all over the gamut in terms of diversity. Um, we are at um, I want to say, actually, we're, we are at 68% female, 32% male. We have 62% um, Hispanic, 5% um, African American, so forth. 57% yeah, free and reduced lunch. Yes. And that's a big factor there, too. It's an absolutely huge factor. Our students come to us from all sorts of backgrounds, and um, they come to us with hope. And that's what we garner, that's what we push is, um, our motto is harnessing the power of dreams. And it's really founded on um, the Jaime Escalante model of Stand Deliver, which was the, the, the uh, film that I grew up on when I became a, a, the teacher. Real quickly, why is it working at your school and not at other similar schools? I can't speak to the other schools. I can speak to our sister schools in the district. Um, since University High has been put in place in Tolleson Union High School District 10 years ago, our sister schools are growing their AP programs. In fact, every AP program that we offer on our campus is offered at all of my sister schools. So I'm very proud of the work that we're doing in our district. Um, I really believe that it's all about hope it's about garnering that hope. It's about working really hard and, and not giving up and having those high expectations and believing all students um, can be successful and can have maintain high rigor. Another traditional school, Sunny Slope High School, uh, I think number 21 in Arizona, mm -hmm. but lots of low-income kids there. Yeah, very similar uh, kind of demographics, except the, the difference is that's a comprehensive high school. So uh, Susan's High School, because I, I think these are possibly the two best high schools, at least 
initially looking at the U.S. News and World rank Rankings because they're actually representative of who's actually in the Arizona school districts and school systems. Uh, and I think Susan's school represents the, those high-achieving students, and Sunny Slope has you know, comprehensive students uh, across the board. 52% free and reduced lunches there. Right. Uh, yeah, way higher than any of the other schools below us. So what do we take from this U.S. News & World Report study? I mean, it, it's, it, the governor says this looks great for Arizona. It will attract business because you, it looks like you know, five of the top ten. Goodness gracious. Mm -hmm. I mean, no matter what metrics you use, that's pretty impressive. What do we take from this? Well, I think uh, what you really take from it, and, and we've got seven of the top 30, if you look at it that way. But I say a lot, a lot of these schools are not fully representative. So, I, I mean, it's great PR, I mean, and I think that's the, the challenge. I mean, U.S. News and World Report gets a lot of public relations out of this. They get a lot of headlines, a lot of press. Uh, but I think it really uh, is important to delve into things a little deeper to look at, you know, that these rankings, like a lot of our educational achievement, is skewed toward higher socioeconomic status. And look for those schools that are doing better, you know, who based on the way they're trying to rank them shouldn't be doing so well. Uh, and, and Susan's school is an example of that. Are, is there anything BASIS does that your school could do, or is it literally apples and oranges? I think there's probably, um, again, not knowing uh, what goes on in the BASIS um, environment and really focusing on ours. Um, actually, we're 21st in the nation. Uh, okay, all right, there we go. Yeah. My, my staff would be like, say something. Um, but. Really, it's, it's what our school offers is a full comprehensive experience. Our students get to be with the Tolleson students and, and perform in sports and, and arts. And so what we do is we teach the kids who come to us. We teach the students in our community. Our students do not have to go outside of the community to have an opportunity of this highly rigorous program. And that's from the foresight of our school board and our superintendent who has really said to us, think outside the box, push those limits, get those kids to achieve. Okay, so University High in Tolleson and Sunny Slope High School, your report specifically mentioned these two as these are the kinds of schools we should be celebrating. A parent watching right now sees, you know, basis up there uh, <laughs> hogging the top 10, and they see these schools as well doing very well, uh, number 21 in the country, last I checked. Um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so um, what does a parent take from all this? Well, you know, it's hard to choose schools. I mean, the, the students who go to BASIS are fantastic. Uh, and, but the students that go to uh, the Union High and Uni University High in, in Tolleson are fantastic, too. Uh, it's just, it's really, imp but the attention that you can get in the media is limited. And, and when you focus in on schools that have a really high socioeconomic status, student population who are already going to be high achievers, and you pull out the high achievers out of that group, uh, and you give them a great curriculum, uh, you then do that. But in fact, you know, uh, at the uh, University High, they've got the same kind of AP curriculum, but they're working with a broader student body. All right. Well, congratulations on your success. Thank you and thank you both for joining us. We do appreciate it. Thank you. This is National Children's Book Week, and the American Library Association is celebrating by honoring three authors. One of them is from Scottsdale. Barbara Park, who passed away in 2013, is best known for her Junie B. Jones series that follows the adventures of an exceedingly curious kindergartner. For more on Barbara Park, her work, her accomplishments, her legacy, we welcome Eric Ruda, Assistant Manager at Harmon Library in Phoenix. Welcome to Arizona Horizon. Thanks for having Good me. Good to have you here. Um, who was Barbara Park? Barbara Park, um, I mean, you got to start with, uh, you can't have a bookstore or a library collection without books by Barbara Park. Uh, everything that I read about her was, she was just an amazing human being. She was an amazing writer, um, but above all else, she was someone who was incredibly funny, and I think that humor really extended down to a lot of her novels. Who is Junie B. Jones? Ah, Junie B. Jones, yes, she was an irreverent kindergartner um, who was very uh, inquisitive, 
very outspoken, didn't really have a filter at all. <laughs> uh, on occasion, she would get into a little bit of mischief like most kids do. Um, but above all else, I think she was someone who really relates to young readers. Uh, there's going to be a plaque dedicated at Cherokee Elementary School, uh, I believe, tomorrow, honoring Barbara uh, Park. The reason at Cherokee Elementary School, it sounds like her first book was written after she saw a kid who missed the bus walking <laughs> home. Is that true? <laughs> I think so. You know, her very first book in the Junie B. Jones series yes. was uh, Junie B. Jones and the Stupid Smelly Bus. That sounds like that. That sounds like it. <laughs> and it's, you know, again, uh, to Barbara Parks' credit, I think she was able to write on the level of these children. She was able to talk about personal experiences that we all go through um, from time to time when we're, when we're really young. Fifty-five million of these yeah. books have been sold so far. I mean, you just kind of referred to it, but go a little deeper. What makes these books so popular? Again, I think the, the biggest thing about her writing ability was just she was able to connect back to the readers. I was talking to a good friend of mine who grew up reading Junie B. Jones as a, as a young kid, and she said that she was really introverted, she was really shy, but she loved the appeal of Junie B. Jones. She was so explosive, she was so brazen, so outspoken, she wanted to be just like Junie B. Jones. I, you know, I was going to say, it, it, might, it has to mean a lot to these kids who read these books. Yeah. Because, and, and I understand it's one of the interesting factors is a lot of the kids will read the books to parents as well as parents reading the books to the kids. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's interesting because I was five at the time when these books came out, the same age as Junie B. Jones. And so what's happening is you're having these kids grow up into adults. They're now having families in, of their own. Yes. And they're now recommending these books to their kids. And so what's happening is you're creating a new generation of readers. And I think that would bring a smile to Barbara Park. As far as children's books in general, how does that Junie B. Jones series, Barbara Park's work, how does it differ from other children's books? You know, it's interesting because when I was a kid, a lot of the books that were recommended to me, Beverly Cleary, um, Laurel Ingalls Wilder, those books, um, they were really written for a different generation. There was no character quite like Junie B. Jones, so outspoken, so brazen. And, you know, I think, again, the whole relatability, just to have someone that you could kind of relate back to, I think that was the most important aspect of it. In general, uh, including Barbara Park, but other authors as well, what makes a good children's book? You know, I think it has a lot to do with the relatability, but also just connecting back to the, the, the young reader, making the adventures, you know, just, you know, just really incredible. Um, the crafting of the story and the characters are, are, are really important facets of it. I would imagine you can't talk down, obviously, because a right, kid will yeah. figure that out in a yeah, heartbeat. Yeah. But you don't want to make it so confusing that the kid puts it down after five pages. Oh, absolutely right. You have to make it exciting. You have to kind of make it a page turner. And again, I think Barbara Park was able to kind of do that with a lot of her books, not including Junie B. Jones, but other books as well. I was going to say she also, she, she, her storylines included divorce, right. included sibling death. Yeah. I mean, that has to be difficult to incorporate that into a children's book. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of the books that came before Junie B. Jones focused on personal and social issues. So she created awareness to a lot of these things. The, the one book that comes to mind was Make Heart Was Here. It talked about this young little girl who was struggling with the personal tragedy of losing a loved one, losing her brother to a biking accident. Mm. And I think that's really good, great for young readers and transitional readers um, and readers of all ages um, to kind of be exposed to that subject matter because we, we live in a very imperfect world and you know those are things that we're going to face and so to kind of see these characters um, you know kind of go through the motions I think it's a really great for for a reader to do that. So what is Barbara Park's legacy? You know I think when you talk about the other really important uh, authors like Beverly Cleary, Judy Bloom, she's right up there. I think what Barbara Park wanted more than anything else was she wanted to create um, or she wanted to share the message of the joy of reading. She wanted to create readers through her books. And I think she's been able to create a whole new generation of readers. I, I think the one big thing that we kind of miss is that, you know, we've had decreased readership for young adults, for young children. And, you know, I think to her, to her credit of creating books like Junie B. Jones, she was able to kind of capture that audience again and to have them read all through those wonderful books. And, and that's my last question here, just in general, asking someone who works at a library, <laughs> are people, are kids, are, are folks 
reading or are we all just so busy looking at a, a little monitor and a little screen? I like to think we are. Um, you know, I think what we try to do as educators, as librarians, as parents, we, we want to establish that reading tradition back into the families. And so that's the greatest hope. We want them to continue reading. We want them to kind of expand their knowledge because, you know, it's, it's something that, you know, they're going to be needing for the rest of their lives. And, you know, not for just a professional setting, but for recreational. What, why not sit down with a good book on sure. when you're vacationing and everything? Uh, and I would imagine it's, it's, it's something you have to convince parents, too. It's like, this is, this is a good thing. Yes. Let that kid read. <laughs> Let that kid read Junie B. Jones to you. Yes, yes. yes. We, we have a Junie B. Jones in all of us, I think. I, I like to think. <laughs> I like to think so, too. <laughs> all right, again, the plaque dedicated at Cherokee Elementary School uh, tomorrow. Good to have you here. Thank you for having me. And Friday on Arizona Horizon, it is the Journalists' Roundtable. We'll have more on how the Republican plan to repeal much of the Affordable Care Act will impact Arizona. And the state legislature continues to close in on a budget and adjournment. Those stories tomorrow on the Journalists' Roundtable. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Next time on Death in Paradise. This is Jack Mooney. Jack joins the honoree police force. Isn't it fantastic?